sing off. Hey, welcome to Pint List. We got uh, Troy Taylor here with us. We're going to have Stuart from Earthbound joining us a little bit later. He's got a work thing he's going to be taken care of. We're going to be exploring the St. Louis Beer Caves uh, this evening. Our beer of the night is the Earthbound Pills, uh, which Stuart will be on as well later to talk about that beer as well. Uh, so, Mr. Troy Taylor, take it away. First point. It's all yours, man. Okay. All right. Sounds good, man. Um, I'm going to share my screen for you guys here. Um, oh, hang on. Did I screw up the setting? No, 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 no. We're good. We're good. I'm just not, my screens are not sharing the way they're supposed to. Hold on just a second. Yes, it's not me that screwed up. No, it isn't you. <laughs> I thought this was already open, so it's only my fault this time. So I clicked on it to open before I went to do something else and didn't double check. So while Troy's getting that up, there are a few announcements real quick. Uh, June 14th, uh, we will be having Vinny from Russian River and Craig coming on to talk about hops, hop extracts, hop utilization, hop selection, and much more on June 14th. And then we will be having um, on May 10th, we've got a smash uh, episode happening on May 10th with Drew Beecham, Denny Khan, uh, Charlie Cole, Giovanni Piva as we get ready, as we're gearing up for the summer smash competition here in St. Louis. We'll be talking all about smash. Then we have the Mead on May 24th. And then on May 3rd, we'll have uh, Stubborn German on talking about alt beer and other classic German styles. And there's more in the works, so stay tuned. Um, Troy, you ready? Well, uh, if I can get the uh, Zoom to come back on. Well, can you see it? My... Okay, well, if you can see my screen, I guess we're good. I can't see your screen, but I can see you. Oh, hmm. All right. Well, let me get... It's not cooperating with me, so hold on. Oh, I know, technology, right? Technology. Technology. It is. It's, it's, usually, it's usually on my end, though. Yeah, I, I, my Zoom will not reopen. Hang on, it, it's it's coming. Well, if you need to exit and come back in, go ahead. No. We can come up with something to talk about. There we go. All right, now I'm going to share my screen so we can get moving here. All right. All right. There it is. There it is. All right. Um, my my interest in the caves of St. Louis, of which I'm sure you guys already know, there are a zillion of them, but uh, or one big giant one, depends on how you look at it. But uh, my interest began, and some of you will not be surprised by this, to know that it started with the Limp family, uh, which were, who of course were the owners of the largest and most profitable brewery in the city of St. Louis for most of the 19th century, despite what they tell you on the Anheuser-Busch tour, which is, as I always say, filled with lies. Anyway, um, it was started by Adam Limp in the early 1840s, and he found that the caves under the city were the perfect place to store his lager beer so that it would age. Um, lager beer was introduced to St. Louis by Adam Limp, and so by finding the caves the way that he did, uh, he had something, a leg up on what everyone else was doing as they tried to imitate his beers in the months and then years to come. Now, after his death, his son, William, expanded the company by buying the land over the cave that Adam had already purchased uh, as a site for their new brewery. And of course, that building still stands today uh, on the south side in the Soulard neighborhood. And it was a massive place. There were three levels above the street and another three levels below the earth to serve as the brewery's lagering caves. Uh, the main buildings were like most breweries of the time included a wash house for containers that would be filled with beer, kettle rooms, hops rooms, dining halls, worker dormitories, cooling rooms, fermenting tubs, a uh, three-story malt house, grain elevators, barrel making shops, stables, everything you could possibly need in the 19th century. Um, it was the most advanced in the city because William was fascinated with new inventions and with any kind of innovations that came to the industry. He had hot and cold running water, which was used in the houses in the neighborhood. Uh, there was a steam plant, an electrical plant, and in 1880, 1877, they began bottling uh, their own beer, uh, which made it possible for limp beer to be shipped out all over the world. But while the brewery itself, with its buildings and smokestacks and everything else, was such a commanding presence on the south side, 
the brewery itself was only as close to being as impressive as what you could find below ground, uh, where the Limps lagering cellars went down for more than three stories before leading into the natural cave that of course then went deeper into the earth. Uh, the upper cellars were accessible from the brewery's basement and they were used to store the beer that was undergoing fermentation. And then the lower cellars divided into about 20 different chambers were used for lagering the beer. And depending on the time of year, the cellars could contain as many as 50,000 barrels at a time, all of them stored in huge casks. Well, the man-made cellars were connected to the natural cave, which had been Adam Limp's original spot for lagering the beer. This entire underground area was kept at a constant year-round temperature of between 35 and 40 degrees. Now, most caves are a standard 52 degrees when you find caves in other locations, but uh, because they needed to be colder, they used vents from the brewery's ice houses, which held about 10,000 tons of ice at a time. There were four additional ice houses on the Mississippi uh, River levee in South St. Louis, and then workmen in the wintertime would cut blocks of ice from the river and then would store them in hay to try to maintain them throughout the summer so that they could continue to be used to cool the beer. Of course, by the late 1870s, the, the lagering cellars were no longer needed because at that point, that's when the next great innovation in beer came along and that was artificial refrigeration. Um, William had been a supporter of all of the experiments that were going on at the time in mechanical refrigeration uh, because he knew what an advantage it would be to the industry and to the limps themselves. Um, he, along with some of the other more forward thinking brewers um, were handing out all kinds of money to inventors of artificial cooling devices and then would give them the space at the brewery to try out their machines, um, which, you know, they paid for a lot of failed prototypes until eventually refrigeration was developed to the point that, that brewers could use it and it would allow them to meet the needs of the ever-growing beer industry. Um, he was eager to add artificial refrigeration to the brewery in 1878. He installed the first refrigerating machine in American brewing history in the Lint Brewery. And of course that started a new era for the company. Well, the installation of the cooling units at the Lint Brewery uh, permanently ended the need for the lagering caves that were located underground. Um, that was really the end of an era in St. Louis because um, you know the, the brewery had been built in the spot where it was built because Adam had purchased that cave in the mid 19th century. Um, and there's more to the story of the Limp Cave. In fact, it's uh, the only cave in St. Louis history really that its life extended into modern times. But St. Louis is, again, I know you guys are probably well aware, um, is sitting on top of a huge complex of, of caves, natural caves. Um, most residents don't realize it, but more than any other city on earth, St. Louis has more caves under its streets, sidewalks, homes, buildings uh, than anywhere else. Um, now, most of them have been abandoned and closed off, but you know they're not forgotten because they were such an important part of the early days of the city. Uh, caves, of course, were man's earliest storage cellars. So that's how we kept food from spoiling back in the days before artificial refrigeration. And when Adam Limp introduced logging, lager beer to St. Louis, he was the first to take advantage of uh, these caves, but of course wouldn't be the last. Now the brewers in St. Louis who used these caves altered them to suit their purposes. They constructed big stone arches and brick ceilings to prevent water from seeping in all the time. They paved the caves uneven floors, built staircases and walkways and installed massive wooden kegs where the beer could be aged. And many of the brewers found that the caves were expensive to open and renovate. So they came up with a plan to allow them to do double duty. Since beer could be stored in the caves, they also served as a place to sell beer too. Many beer gardens and taverns were located right in the caves and they were especially popular in the summer. St. Louis being the humid sweat hole that it is would often people would look for a place to stay cool and that was a place to do it. Uh, they became popular drinking establishments and night spots and uh, it was a good place to go to escape the heat. Now, one of the first cave attractions in the city was Urig's Cave, which was opened by 
Andrew and Franz Urich in the 1850s. They had started their Camp Springs Brewery in 1839, but a piece of land with a cave underneath it became available between Locust Street and Washington Avenue, so they bought it. They'd been losing money trying to lager their beer with river ice for a long time, and this seemed to be the perfect answer to what they needed. So they went to work on the cave. Now, it was naturally only about 170 feet deep, so they dug to make it deeper, built brick walls, high arch ceilings to keep the water out, and as work progressed, they realized the cave was actually connected to a number of other small caverns. And what you have to understand is back then, people didn't understand that the caves were mostly one big massive system. And everybody thought that you were getting another cave, even though it was the same cave, but they just knocked down some walls and just kept digging. And they ended up spending an estimated $100,000 to connect all of the caves that were on their property. They also installed a narrow gauge railroad that would transport the beer from the brewery to the cave. And once that was completed, they decided to open the cave for business. Of course, not just for storage, but as a place to serve beer. The entrance was located in a shady grove of trees, very close by buggy ride from downtown. And it turned into a very popular spot for people to come listen to music and have a glass of cold beer. They arranged tables in one of the larger cave rooms and they had band concerts there, dining and dancing. They even did tours of the cave and the loggering rooms. And it became known as St. Louis's original Saint, you know, beer garden for the city. Um, it was only the Civil War that slowed them down. Uh, during those four years, they suspended all entertainment at the cave, but they lost so much money during the war that when it was over, they ended up selling the cave to a man named Chris Nunst, and he was never as successful with it because he let things sort of run down, but he did try adding a small theater and tried turning the cave <laughs> into not only a, a place that you could serve beer, but also as an opera house. Now, uh, in 1884, he sold the cave to a saloon keeper named Thomas McNeary, who expanded on the theater idea and turned the cave into a vaudeville house. Now, McNeary and his brothers owned the cave during its time of its greatest popularity. And they brought a lot of entertainers who came to St. Louis uh, to perform at their, at their cave. Uh, they installed the very first electric lights ever used in a St. Louis night spot in the cave. And during its peak, the cave boasted an audience of up to 3,000 people every single night. They came to drink, they enjoyed music, they saw plays. Uh, they, uh, operas, all kinds of stuff. But the glory days only lasted for about four more years. In 1888, McNeary lost his liquor license and the theater was closed down. Uh, it remained abandoned until 1900 when there was a short-lived attempt to restore the theater. And then from 1903 to 1908, the cave was used at different times as a roller skating rink, a bowling alley, and even as a mushroom farm but none of them lasted very long. Finally, McNary gave up his, uh, his uh, try running the business and offered a 90 year lease to a group called the Businessmen's League. And they built an auditorium on top of the cave uh, and the beer garden and much of the surrounding area. Their plan was to create a facility that would host sporting events, theater performances and more. And in 1908, they broke ground on what became known as the St. Louis Coliseum. Now the Coliseum, sitting on top of this cave, opened in 1909 when famed evangelist Gypsy Smith began a series of revival meetings. He attracted more than 10,000 people a night, and then from then on, he uh, uh, the Coliseum was used for circuses, for the Veiled Prophet Ball, uh, for opera. People came to see Enrico Caruso there. Uh, later on, they would see Johnny Tarzan Weissmuller swim in what was then regarded as the largest, world's largest swimming pool. In 1916, the Democratic National Convention was held in the building. And then the most popular event ever held there was in 1927, when there was a wrestling match between Joe Strecker and Ed the Strangler Lewis. The Coliseum was completely sold out and the match lasted for 14 hours. Strangler Lewis won, by the way, in case you had money on it. Uh, despite all this, the Coliseum was never a financial success. 
Um, as early as 1914, they were cited for back taxes and being behind on their rent. Uh, ownership reverted back to the McNeary estate. And Tom McNeary had died back in 1893, but his family kept the place until 1925 when it was purchased by a New York group who planned to renovate it. Um, they tried everything they could think of to try to get people to come there, but the construction of the St. Louis Arena in 1929 and the Keele Auditorium in 1934 pulled all the big, big events away from the Coliseum, mostly because there was nowhere to park. Um, this place had been built when, at a time when few people had automobiles, and now by the late 1930s, there was no place for anybody to park when they came to events. The last event held at the Coliseum was a wrestling match in 1939. Then during World War II, it sat empty. It was used as a storage spot for new automobiles that had been frozen by government regulations at the beginning of the war. They weren't allowed to sell them. So it just sat there empty. And when the war ended, it sat empty for three more years. And finally in 1953 was condemned by the city as unsafe. Later that same year, they knocked it down. And while it was being torn down, everyone got one last look at Yurig's cave, which was still hidden away intact underneath the building. Most of the old passageways remained along with the man-made brickwork and the natural spring that was on the property. But the new construction that took over on the site destroyed everything that was left of, of Yurik's cave. So now all we have are just some stories and so few photographs that exist. Now, Yurik's cave was not the only beer garden located in a St. Louis cave. Uh, and theirs was far from the only brewery that took advantage of the natural coolness for lagering. Uh, many of the breweries, though, as I mentioned earlier, actually used different parts of the same caves for their operations, never realizing they were all connected. One cave was used by 14 breweries all at the same time, and none of them had any idea that they weren't the only occupants. <laughs> well, uh, one brewer, Excelsior Brewery, set up operations at a cave in 1880, unknowingly sharing the same space with Franklin Brewery, which had started just south on Market Street in 1855. Both of those breweries were cleared to make way for Union Station in 1894. Uh, the companies had gone out of business by then, but the caves were still there underneath the building. And they may have been forgotten at the time, but they wouldn't stay that way. In 1933, the city made plans to widen Market Street, and as engineers started their excavations, they broke into the abandoned cave. Surveyors entered the caverns and found the remains of the old brewery, as well as the second level that was still contained uh, wooden fermenting tanks. They discovered masonry walls, brick columns, and at one end of the tunnel found an abandoned mushroom bed that had been grown as a crop. Well, beneath this level, they entered a deep cellar, now accessible only by a almostly rotted wooden ladder. And in there, they found vaulted arches and huge wooden chambers and vats for beer, all still completely intact. Well, after this rediscovery, the cave was sealed up and then completely forgotten for about 20 more years. So suddenly, more work was being done along Market Street and the cave was discovered so to speak, again. Unfortunately, this latest discovery occurred when a portion of the cave collapsed, opening a large pit in the middle of the street. Engineers tried to fill it in, but they found it was 25 feet deep, and it ended up taking 4,000 cubic yards of dirt just to fill the collapsed area. Well, then a year later, a sidewalk collapsed in front of the post office and opened up on the same cave. This time, government engineers had to drive steel beams into the floor of the cave so the sidewalk could be supported. And since then, those supports have managed to hold. But I always say, based on what's already happened before, it seems like a matter of time before that cave shows up again. So I always tell people, keep that in mind if you're walking around downtown. There was and probably still is a cave right underneath your feet. Well, in 1833, a German immigrant named Christian Stalin uh, or started a brewery at 18th and Lafayette Streets because of its access to a cave and a natural spring. This building is the Phoenix Brewery, and they expanded their caves for a beer garden. Uh, it was sold two more times before it closed down in 1920. Well, in 1964, the old brewery buildings were destroyed to make way for the expansion of Interstate 55. Uh, the cave is still there, but there's no way to get to it. And there were a lot of other breweries that also used caves, including Whitman and Roast. 
uh, Green Tree Brewery, Theodore Schwer and Company, Pittsburgh Brewery, Jackson Brewery, Arsenal Brewery, Gambrinus Brewery, Anthony and Kuhn Brewery, and many, many, many others. Uh, but I have to bring the story around full circle and back to the Lemp Cave, because that's the one that got my interest started. And I have to say, it's probably the most entertaining of all the stories, because it has an afterlife. This turned out to be, as I mentioned earlier, the only famous St. Louis cave that endured into modern times. It actually became a very popular tourist spot before closing down in the early 1960s when it was known as Cherokee Cave. But this was originally the same cave that Adam Limp had bought when he went looking for an underground chamber in which to lager his beer. Adam began using the cave in 1845. His workmen expanded the natural confines of the cavern and fitted it for use for the brewery. During the early days of the brewery's history, Adam was still making beer downtown on 2nd Street and then taking it by wagon to the cave for lagering. Uh, Williams Brewery, of course, would be built on the surface, but at that point it was still years away. Around 1850, at the same time the Limp Brewery was beginning to grow, a fur trader named Henry Chatillon built a house on a piece of property that adjoined Adam's parcel on the crest of Arsenal Hill on 13th Street. Then in 1856, Dr. Nicholas Deminal purchased the land and expanded the farmhouse that had been built there and added several rooms, uh, the portico that you see there on the front facing eastward overlooking a garden and below that, the Mississippi River. This Greek revival mansion became a favorite landmark for steamship pilots as they rounded a curve on the river. Well, then in 1865, Dr. Deminal leased the southwest corner of the property to the Minnehaha Brewery, which built a small two-story wood frame brewing house on the site. They also used the cave under the property to lager their beer, the same cave that Adam Limp was using, just a different section of it. Now, because at that time when you bought land and there was a cave underneath it, the, your use of the cave had to stop where your property ended. So they ended up building a wall between the limp side of the cave and the Minnehaha side of the cave. Uh, that divided it between where Dr. Deminal's property ended and the limps began. But the limps were on good terms with the doctor, probably no not so great terms with the guys with the tiny little competing brewery. Uh, when William had been renovating the house down the block for his own family, he had made an arrangement to run pipelines from the brewery complex through Dr. Deminal's cave. And this purchased the Limp Mansion along with Dr. Deminal's house with hot and cold running water. Well, the cave was used for brewery operations until the late 1870s, of course, when artificial refrigeration units were installed. And after that, the cave would not play any other major roles in the production of beer. Instead, it was turned into, for lack of a better term, an entertainment complex for the Limp family. Uh, there was an entrance to the cave in the basement of the mansion. Um, it's still there, it's just bricked off now. Uh, to reach it, the Limps traveled by way of a quarried shaft that linked with the cave, and from there, they could enter the lagering, lagering cellars of the brewery. And the, the story was that William often used to use this route to go back and forth to the mansion uh, from his brewery office when the weather was bad. But one of the cave's chambers was used as a ballroom where the limps occasionally held parties. And then another chamber was converted into a theater. Uh, across one end of the space, they put up imitation cave walls uh, using plaster and wire screen so that it would kind of create a backstage storage area on their makeshift stage in the chamber. Uh, ironically, though, the workmen had to tear out all the natural features of the cave to create the fake cave walls. Anyway, they put in crude floodlights to illuminate the stage, and the limps would then hire actors who came to St. Louis for shows to come out and put on command performances for themselves and their friends in their underground theater. Well, after Prohibition, the caves were abandoned and the entrances were sealed off. But this wasn't the end for what had once been the Minnehaha portion of the cave. In November of 1946, a pharmaceutical manufacturer named Lee Hess bought the Minnehaha part of the cave, as well as the old Deminal house. 
he began developing the cave as a tourist attraction, erected a museum building and a parking lot to serve what he began calling Cherokee Cave. Now in April of 18, or 1950, Cherokee Cave was open to the public. Visitors were able to stroll along a tour that took them to Cherokee Lake, the Petrified Falls, and the famous Spaghetti Room, where slender cave formations hung down from the ceiling like spaghetti. And it was a pretty nice place. I mean, as you can see from the, uh, the photo on the left hand or the right hand side, that's the lobby of the museum. So it wasn't any kind of fly by night tourist trap. It was a pretty nice place. Well, the cave remained open until 1960. And a year later, it was purchased from Hess by the Missouri Depart Highway Department, who had plans to demolish the museum and close the cave to make room for Interstate 55. The cave was lost, but Hess fought until the end of his life to keep the, the state from tearing down the Deminal Mansion. Eventually, he succeeded, and the cave museum and the entrance that Hess created were demolished in 1964. And today, the Deminal Mansion still stands, but seems to be feet away from the interstate. Uh, but the only reminder of what used to be there is that short little street near Broadway in Cherokee called Cave Street. Uh, the Deminal Mansion became a historic site and a museum. Well, for many years after the highway tore through this historic part of the city, it was believed that Cherokee Cave had been filled in and completely destroyed, but this was later discovered to be incorrect. In fact, portions of the cave still exist today, and I've been down there, so I've seen it. A few years ago, I had the chance to tour the old lint brewery and the cave underneath it. Uh, the sub-basement uh, becomes the first level of the cave. The floors are covered with mud, uh, slippery. There's moss, there's algae, water dripping from everywhere. Bricks are crumbling, it's so wet down there. Uh, but after leaving the finished areas of the cave with the stone, or at least with the loggering cellars, with the stone floors and the brick line walls, we went into the natural cave beyond it, uh, which then took us past, um, you know, uh, the uh, where the theater was, there was mud, there's debris, there's metal brackets and chains up above on the ceiling uh, that were once how they used to haul the ice into the loggering caves. And then Beyond that, we entered what was left of Cherokee Cave. Uh, when it had opened as a show cave, the rocks had been smoothed out. They had opened up a floor, a, a smooth floor with curbs on each side to try to keep some of the water out. And those improvements along with the rest of the wiring and the light boxes and everything that Lee Hess did and left behind in 1860 are all still there. I mean, you can still see all the commercial aspects of the cave. There are metal handrails and carved floors. And, um, you know, we went as far as we could underneath the, the um, underneath the street there heading toward the Limp Mansion, but we couldn't make it all the way. Uh, the water started to get pretty deep and the air, we couldn't light, we kept trying to light lighters to make sure we could still breathe. And after a while, when well, they didn't work anymore, we realized we were gonna have to go back. So um, uh, Cherokee Cave is still down there. Um, but, I mean, obviously, but for obvious reasons, it can't be open to the public, but maybe someday it will be. There has been talk of trying to reopen it for quite a few years now, but I don't know if it will ever amount to anything. I guess we'll see. So anyway, um, as I think most of you guys who are out here know, I've written a couple of books about St. Louis history, Haunted St. Louis, and a book about the limp suicide and spirits. And if you're ever, if you haven't read them, if you're ever interested, Ryan could get you the information on how to get them. So thanks for having me on tonight. Uh, I was excited when Ryan asked me to uh, offer something about the caves because uh, I, I love cave exploring and traveling in caves and in general and especially since that's what really got me interested in St. Louis and the Limps Caves. Um, it's been uh, a lot of fun to uh, to get to talk to you about them. So thanks guys. Well thanks Troy. Uh, if you have any questions put them in the chat box. Uh, if you're on the yeah, Facebook just side just or if you're on the Zoom side. But I have a quick question real quick Troy. You've been down in the caves yes. and you've been down in the caves uh, well, maybe not fairly recently, but it was a few you know, years. Uh, what's happening to the caves? You know, are, are the caves taking themselves back or are they just kind yeah. of falling down? What's happening in the, inside the caves? When you leave and you go into the, when you leave the loggering cellars and go out into the natural part of the cave, 
it's slowly creeping into the lager cellars that there's moss and algae are starting to grow. There are formations that are starting to grow back in areas that they had cleared out, you know, in the 1840s. I mean, in the lifetime of a cave, you know, 180 years, is it really that long? But it's long enough that the formations are starting to come back. So yeah, it is, it is slowly starting to take it over again, for sure. So cool. I, I don't know that we'll ever get, I mean, I don't know that it'll ever be opened. I mean, I've been hearing for years that they want to reopen the cave, but I, I don't see in this, in this day and age when you can sue everybody for everything, I don't see how they would ever be able to get that, you know, safe enough for people to go down there again. It would take millions of dollars. So did you ever run into any animals, bats or rats or no, oh, I'm sure they're down there. I'm sure there's, I've, I've seen some photographs of lizards and stuff that are down there. Um, and I'm sure that there are, are plenty of things moving, but we didn't see any. So not when I was there. Um, I really want to get down on those caves, but you know, we can't get down there, but how many breweries, uh, if you don't know the answer, I mean, this isn't your oh, forte, okay. but you know, how many breweries were using these caves back, you know, pre-World War II, or I'm sorry, pre-World War I? I think that, um, I don't have an exact number. I mean, but I've been able to count up that I know of at, at more than 30 that were all downtown and on the south side. So at least, at least 30 or more. Because, I mean, once one person does it, you know how that goes. I mean, once Adam Limp started serving lager beer, then everybody did because it became popular because before that, all there was was ale in the city. And, you know, you had just British type stuff that was being made and served because, you know, there weren't that many Germans until the 1840s and 50s. And then when you have all these Germans, they want lager beer. <laughs> so there you right. go. And so everybody started making it. And once they knew that you know, using those caves would, was a way to, you know, to actually logger it, they, everybody started using it. So yeah, for sure. Um, so I think there, I mean, I, like I said, I know of at least 30, I mean, at one time there was, um, you know, there were 14 people using one cave, let alone all the other caves that were still in use. And again, I'm not convinced that what's under St. Louis isn't just one system of caves. Uh, like Mammoth Cave in Kentucky is considered the world's largest cave because every cave in that part of Kentucky is all really just one cave. And that's probably what St. Louis is too. I just think that, you know, they couldn't get access to parts of it and nobody knew and it was all divided up by who owned what property, you know, on top of the cave, that kind of thing. Um, I did see that, yeah, and I agree with you. I'm sure they became very popular in July and August uh, when there was no fans or air conditioning of any kind in St. Louis. Um, and I'd Sammy ask if there was um, a swimming pool in the cave. No, that, that's, not, that's not a true story. There is a pool, but it is just a concrete lined drainage pool because when they had a channel cut into the floor because when all the ice melted in the lagering cellars, because even though it's cool down there, the ice still melted and the water had to go somewhere. So it would run down that shaft and into a pool. And so the, the pool would gather there, but it, believe me, no one could swim in it because it's only, well, you can't see my hands. It's only like maybe two feet deep and it's lined with concrete. And I mean, you could wade in it, I suppose, but uh, when I saw it, I, there's, I wouldn't put anything into that water. I wouldn't even put my finger into it. It was so nasty. Um, and that's no contaminant other than just nature. So um, yeah, but somehow, I, you know, I know that there's a story that's gotten started about the, the basin there, but uh, that it was a swimming pool, but it actually wasn't. Um, that, that part of it is just part of the legend. So, but yes, I did see it. Um, and I had, that's actually one of those pictures was a picture of the pool with the concrete line around it, but this shows you how shallow that it was. So um, I don't know about the, um, the college, but there are, I just saw an article not very long ago about in St. Louis Magazine about the caves. 
there are there is a group that is trying to um, catalog them and hopefully try to preserve the caves if possible. Um, but they are trying to at least find out how many are still accessible. Um, and a lot of the, you know that used to be done on kind of a um, kind of a covert guerrilla style, you know, sneak in, you know, kind of thing. And now that people are actually getting permission to do it. There was a great book written in the early 60s uh, by a couple that were between like 19, probably 1940 and 1960, who were entering caves all over the city and doing it on the sly and trying to find entrances and tracking down stories and leads and how to get into the caves. And it was called, um, it's just called Caves of St. Louis. And it's, a, it's available, I think it's still in print, uh, but it used to be available on Amazon. There are a couple of different editions of it. So I'm gonna guess it's back in print, but it's a fun book. It's really fun. It's not very big, it's not very long. And it was just this guy, um, her name is Charlotte, his name, I can't, maybe Joe, uh, but their last name was Rother, R-O-T-H-E-R. And they just kind of documented their explorations of caves in, you know, uh, around the, you know, between World War II and the early 60s. And uh, it's a cool little book. Uh, and it's, it's worth checking out if you have an interest in the caves. So, and some of the big, there's a couple of big books on um, St. Louis breweries, and they will often give a background and a history behind it um, and whether or not they use the caves. So I guess you could go through that count, you know, if you wanted a number. But yeah, pretty cool. So that's. So, uh, what, do you know what the location um, or what is now where the St. Louis Coliseum used to be? Um, I, I've got the address somewhere. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Um, I've got the address. I just don't remember. I probably wrote it down somewhere and didn't, just didn't put it in my notes for this um, tonight. Let me see. So, so I might uh, be able to tell you. You're, you're a cave diver, and you told me an interesting story on Saturday when you were going through the caves, and, and you kept going further and further back, but you had to stop. Why did you have to stop? Well, because um, the air, it looks like Locust Street and Washington Avenue was where they put, the Urigs put their place. So I'm going to say that the Coliseum was pretty close to that. Um, we had to stop because we didn't think there was any more air that we could breathe. Uh, there was too much, there's, there's gas that gathers down there and uh, we were running out of oxygen. And so we couldn't, we couldn't keep the match lit. Um, we got nervous as we kept going. And then, so we decided we'd better try to see if we could get the lighter going and see if there was a flame and what it wouldn't catch anymore or didn't stay lit we realized there was not enough oxygen for a match. So there definitely wasn't enough oxygen for us to be breathing. So we turned around and came back. So, and then there was the monster, but other than that. Oh, I, see if oh yeah. You saw Cthulhu down there. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if you were listening. <laughs> yeah. You saw Cthulhu down there. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, go ahead, Art. Well, I, it was, this is too complex for me to, to put into writing, so let me just blurt it out. Um, I, I grew up in, in, in St. Louis and around there from the 50, 50s through the 70s, and then by the 80s, I was gone. And I always heard rumors about these caves, but why do you think, I mean, if they were still kind of being used in the 40s, you said? Well, I know people were getting into them. Um, why did they drop out so fast and so completely? I well, mean, all, all of a sudden, they got forgotten. Yeah, they did. Um, I think when most of the breweries stopped using them and then there were still, they were still around and by, you know, by 1960, when they closed Cherokee Cave, that was really kind of where it came to an end. I mean, I think at that point, I think if you, if my, my honest opinion is, is that society changed so much by that time that it was unsafe. And now people were following rules about things being unsafe, but you'd still find people who would get into them and, and get down in them and, you know, get into the caves and explore, but you couldn't bring people in. We, by, by World War II and after, there were so many different laws had been passed and things, had ju things just changed. And people were not, um, you know, not willing to open them up to let people in because they were afraid they'd get sued. 
or people were not going in, at least they weren't going in and talking about it because they'd get arrested for trespassing. And I think, I think society just changed. And I think interest changed too. There was no way, except for Cherokee Cave, none of the caves in St. Louis had ever been anything that you could develop into what's called a show cave, like Merrimack Caverns or any of that kind of stuff. A Cherokee Cave was the only one large enough for that. The others were might have been large, but you'd have to do so much work to break into them. Plus, a lot of them were located downtown. And St. Louis is a, well, like many cities, but St. Louis is a terrible habit of just tearing everything down. Um, they, don't, they don't like to renovate and, and preserve. They just like, they tear it down, start over again. It's like Las Vegas or something down. I mean, it's this, the amount of stuff that's been lost in St. Louis is mind boggling. When you see some of the photographs of some of the old buildings and stuff, it's just terrifying to see what's been done. But, and I think that so much of that downtown was developed and it just, I mean, the caves are still there, but it's just can't get to them anymore. You know, they're just too hard to get to them. And too hard to develop into anything. And I think they just kind of fell out of public interest, you know, so. Yeah, I, I, I've said this on, on, on things we've talked about before about St. Louis. St. Louis, for some reason, has a real issue with not embracing their legacy. Oh. Uh, um, they, they, uh, I wound up doing a documentary film that took 11 years on the biggest restoration in the United States because I'm from St. Louis, but it was done in Salt Lake City. Uh, and, and I remember thinking, man, I, even as a kid growing up, they're tearing it down, they're tearing it down, they're tearing it down. Why? Yeah, yeah I know it. I know it. So, yeah, it's crazy. So. Cool. So, well, Stuart has joined us. He, he's done with his work thing. Uh, almost looks like Stuart's down in the caves. <laughs> uh, so, Troy, real quick, I, I know you have to go. I know you have uh, things that you need to do this evening, but uh, my last question for you is you talk about the caves. Was it the caves that really brought you into re doing all the research you had done on the Lemp Brewery and the Lemp family history, as well as other works that you've done was part of that because of your interest and passion for just cave diving? Yeah, well, I did, I did get really interested in when I found out that, that St. Louis had a show cave at one time, Cherokee Cave. I got fascinated with it and then found out, I mean, long time later, found out that Cherokee Cave and the Limp Cave were the same thing. And uh, that kind of clinched it for me. And I mean, you know that the reason that my, I got so interested in the Limps is because of all the ghost stories though. So you know that was my, that was my gateway, but the, the cave clinched the deal for sure. So, but yeah, I do love that stuff. So. Cool. Well, uh, you know, the last call for questions for Troy, uh, if not, we will shift over to Stuart, uh, and Stuart, it looks like you're, you're like broadcasting right from the cave right there underneath the brewery. You're on mute, buddy. Uh, not, a lot of, not a lot of occasion to use, um, uh, not a lot of occasion to use zoom as a uh, stay at home dad slash occasional brewer. Um, yes, I am indeed recording from, uh, the caves. Cool. Uh, we do have a question from Ernie on the Facebook side. He's asking, were the caves used as speakeasies during Prohibition? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, they were not. And uh, from what I know about the lagering cellars and the underground spaces underneath the Cherokee Brewery Company, they were all filled in with construction debris when they demolished the brewery buildings uh, in the 1890s. Cool. Well, you know what? Let's uh, let's move past history. Let's get into modern, and uh, let's move over to the Earthbound Pills. What do we have here? What did you use in this sucker? I'm drinking it. I'm enjoying the heck out of it. Oh what man, I love here? this beer. It's 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 clean as crisp. It's got a really nice mouthfeel to it. It's not lingering. It's just really really nice, easy drinker. What what we got here? We got. Um, yeah, well, so the go. ingredients in this beer are um, Pilsner malt. Obviously, we use uh, select pills from, um, I believe it's Proximity Malt. I think that's who does it. Uh, we used to use Ida pills because uh, we really like the little bit of extra body you get out of it and a little bit of extra color. But we uh, we changed, or the, the grain supplier we used, Bono Burns, um, started uh, carrying Proximity over uh, whoever it is that does Ida pills. 
you'll have to forgive me. It's been a, I've, I've been huffing glue all day in the basement and we just had a big all hands staff meeting to decide when we were going to reopen. So I'm a little out of it. That was, uh, Car what was that it used to be Cargill. Yeah, it is Cargill. Yes. Um, which, and is I, no, which is no longer, I think great Western malting technically it's a whole thing. Anyway, um, Bono switched to proximity malts and prairie malts. And so we switched over to the select pills and we've been very pleased with it as far as a, uh, a premium Pilsner malt goes. Uh, pretty much the only nicer thing we could get is probably from like Sugar Creek malting. And we haven't, we haven't discussed that yet, but maybe that's coming. Yeah. Uh, we use some uh, Carapils and I believe just a little bit of C10 because uh, we wanted to have just a touch more color and we really wanted to, we wanted to be able to hold head retention pretty well. Um, I think the biggest thing that probably sets our Pilsner apart from a lot of other Pilsners is that rather than making a Czech style Pilsner or a, like they call it a Bohemian Pilsner, but a Bohemian style lager, um, we went with a Danish or Northern European style, uh, lager, uh, specifically based off of, uh, Zivitz out of Poland and Jever out of, I believe, Denmark. Um, I know about Jaeger because I had a buddy uh, who was from Hamburg, Germany, and it was his favorite cheap beer. Um, and so what we learned in tasting these beers and in um, researching the styles is that Northern European Pilsners are typically much more hop forward and the water chemistry is a little different, uh, but they typically have a noticeable hop aroma and they have a much stronger hop bite. And really the showcase is less on the Pilsner malt and the, the yeast strain and much more on just having this really perfectly drinkable beer. And I assume that most people watching are probably from the St. Louis area. You guys know how hot it gets here in the summer. Um, I really appreciate this beer because it does have that little bit of extra hop bite and it really, to me, it makes the beer a lot more refreshing. Yeah, um, and I think I missed the hops. Uh, the hops in the beer? Oh, I haven't talked about them yet, sorry. Oh, okay, good, Actually, then, I didn't, then I didn't miss it. Uh, we're experimenting with the hops right now. In fact, we've been using Lubelski hops. Um, we found a wonderful uh, hop importer. Um, uh, it's Polish hops. They work with 45th parallel hops out of Michigan. They import uh, a couple of different um, Polish hop styles. And so we're, um, we're slowly coming towards a blend of Lubelski and Marinka hops. Um, the, the, the version I'm drinking right now is entirely Lubelski hops. I believe that's the version you all have as well. Uh, the next version that's going to get canned is entirely Marinka hops, and we're gonna we're gonna taste test them side by side and see what we want to do moving forward or how we want to blend them. Well, you better email me so I can sit down with you. Oh, go ahead. You better email me so I can sit down with you and side by side them with you. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, for sure. Let's do that. So. Um, Something that I like about these Lubelski hops, and I want to talk about it just because I'm thinking about it and it's really cool. They have a really noticeable floral aroma. They're much more floral than spicy, but they have a very, very, very pronounced bergamot note, which is very fun with a really light wort, like a Pilsner wort. Um, and you notice it very hard in fermentation. It's this like bergamot, like almost blackberry leaf aroma, and it's just out of nowhere and it's super cool. Fantastic. Uh, uh, yeast, what we got here working for yeast? Are we are we going with the old standby workhorse 3470 from Von Hestefan, or we got something we different? We are not. Sweet. Um, I love you. You're very welcome. So <laughs> um, I, I love many beers. Um, I wouldn't be doing what I do without beer, without loving beers. I struggle with a lot of the craft loggers and craft pilsners that are on the market because I find that they have this really intensely earthy flavor that comes from a couple of the different lager strains. Uh, like a very, it's, a, it's like a clean dirt flavor, if that makes sense. Um, and it's good, but it's not what I was looking for in this expression of a Pilsner. We really wanted something that was clean and neutral, and we just really wanted it to snap on the end. And so we're using um, S189. Uh, it's the soft lager S189. We use 500 gram dry bricks for our pitches for this for seven barrels. Um, and I don't, I apologize. I don't remember off the top of my head uh, where S189 comes from. Um, but it is a, I think it's, it might be Hormandal, not Hormandal. It might be a, it might be a Swiss lager, but it's a very, very, very clean fermenter. It's got, it really has very little ester production. And I find that it, um, it, it highlights a lot of what you want out of hop bitterness in it. Um, it downplays just a bit 
uh, some of the some of the sweetness, the, the residual cereal sweetness from the malt. Yeah, I think it is. I think it is a Switzerland uh, based yeast. I, I have to go back and go through my notes and look it up. But I, I think I think sure Hormandal might be a Kvik varietal. I think I'm. Yeah, Hormandal is, is a Kvik. Uh, but I think. Yeah, I've been. I, the, I really what, have been huffing PVC glue like all week. So like I don't even. <laughs> yeah, the one in it, I, I'm, I think it is the the Swiss variety. Yeah. Uh, uh, which is really wonderful. Uh, it's a low. I mean, it's like twice, yeast, especially, it's twice as expensive as the other lager yeast, dry lager yeast. But in, in our opinion, it's very worth it. Yeah, it, it brings a lot. Of, it brings a lot of different things to the table, especially you know that crispness. It really yeah, brings that crispness to the forefront. Uh, so we're we're through the beer. I really enjoy this beer. I, I picked some up for me on Saturday, and I'm, I've just been really enjoying it. Uh, it's just, just enjoyable. I mean, it's well done. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, it is. And it's, this is one of those. This is one of those brewers' tricks, right? You like spend all day sweating your ass off, and you walk into the tap room at the end of your workday to have a beer. Mm -hmm. This is the beer you want at the end of a sweaty brew day. Like it's a four p.m. Yeah. sweaty. All you have to do is finish knockout and spray out the boil kettle, and you're like, I'm gonna sneak in and have a beer while the pump's running. And this is the perfect yep. beer you want. And I know it is because that's what my brewers do every day. Yep, and every brewery has that go-to beer. Like, okay, I'm I'm done. Oh, yeah. I, I got cleanup pumps running. They've got that one beer that they go to the tap handle and they pour it while they're waiting for the pumps to and everything to clean yep. up. And they just sit down after the end of the. Yep, everybody's got it. So for every every civilian out there, if the brewery doesn't have a lager on and they have a Kolsch, the brewers have paid way more attention to that Kolsch than they have anything else because it's what they drink. Yep, pretty much. Yep. If that if you see the brewers pouring in their glass at the end of the day that they, they, yeah, they definitely paid more attention to that beer than everything else on the wall so let's get into your caves man you've got caves right underneath the brewery i do and uh, also the adjoining properties next to the brewery which is yeah like yeah uh but they don't use them exactly like you use them right right um so what do you use them for oh so we currently use them for storage which is what you do with the cave if you have one um I am currently about 25 feet underground. Um, let's see. We'll see if we can see some stuff here. Uh, the lighting is not great, but kind of hard to see. Are you using it for keg storage, or are you using it for? Are oh, there's all of, there's a whole float of kegs back there that have all come back from distribution because nobody bought draft beer for a year. <laughs> oh no. No, I mean, it's fine. It's great. We got all of our kegs back in house. We get to do a bunch of QA and QC and, uh, you know, make sure that everything's clean and our, uh, our cleaning regimes work. But yeah, that's, um, one of the make vinegar. We could do that. Actually. I would love, I've actually, I wanted to make vinegar. And I also, um, I have a, uh, a friend who owns Parker's table on Oakland and Yale, this fancy bottle shop. And he, he's offered repeatedly to get us a vinegar barrel. Uh, to try to age a beer in a vinegar barrel. And like, I've thought about it because I think we could like blend and do some cool stuff, but no, yeah, that's, that's, that's barrels that. around down here sucks. So I can't get buy in from everyone else. Um, yeah. But yeah, so um, we own our keg float. We don't lease kegs. And so uh, we have like seven, do we have 700 kegs? I don't think we have 700 kegs. We have, we own a lot of kegs. I don't know how many it is. I don't remember anymore. And I'm sure we've lost a bunch of them. Uh, but yeah, we, we currently store those down here. Cause that's like, that takes up a lot of space. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with earthbound beer, um, we are located at 2724 Cherokee street. And we are on the site of the former Cherokee brewery company, which was active from 1866 to somewhere between 1899 and 1902, depending on who you ask. And they used to take up the entire block. And the reason they were on this block originally is because there was a giant sinkhole here. This was one of the feeder caves to the Cherokee cave slash limp cave complex. Um, and so they had a big sinkhole that had filled up with clay. So somebody bought the land, they quarried out all of the, they kilned out all of the clay into bricks. They quarried out the limestone into rusticated pediment blocks. They had a big rectangular hole in the ground and they built from underneath um, this massive underground brewery complex uh, with uh, groin vaulted ceilings with um, areas for uh, winches and pulleys and ventilation shafts and they uh, used these uh, this underground complex to age beer uh, they would bring in giant blocks of river ice down the uh, down the Mississippi River and they would store them in these basements and keep the basements cold in the traditional German lagering uh, the traditional German lagering uh, I guess tradition, but yes, the way they would do things in the home country. Um, 
And um, the Cherokee Brewery Company was kind of interesting because in addition to making just, you know, Ger these were German brewers, in addition to making German style beers, they also made porters, they made a pale, I don't know if it was a pale ale, I know that they, they did, I think they had a pale ale, they made a variety of English styles as well. Um, and like their version of pale ale was obviously vastly different than what we drink today, but um, they had a whole variety of, of styles that they made and they peaked at about 11,000 barrels a year. Um, and they even installed some early commercial refrigeration as well. But um, as a lot of you are probably aware, Anheuser-Busch and the Limps really started consolidating the supply chain and they got very big and they, um, they were able to make beer more cheaply and make it more efficiently and sell it more cheaply and more efficiently. And a lot of the smaller breweries like the Cherokee Brewery Company um, started consolidating with a bunch of other smaller breweries and then eventually closing. And so in 1899, um, the brewery, I think it was 1899, I believe it was sold to Greenleaf Brewing, um, which was a consolidated group. And then it was closed in 1902. And over the next two decades, they started demolishing the buildings um, that composed, comprised the, uh, the brewery complex. Um, the, and when, and there was a, there's a law or there was a law in the city of St. Louis that if you had one of these big underground basements or excavations and you did demolition of your building, you had to fill in the basements and excavations because they were worried about subsidence. They were worried about collapses, sinkholes, stuff like that. So the uh, where I'm standing right now was actually full of clay. Um, the only remaining structure from the brewery complex is the stockhouse, and that's where our tap room is. It was a uh, it's a four story building. It has really like 17 foot high ceilings. It was designed entirely for holding uh, holding an aging beer. And uh, we actually still use the basement, which is about 20 feet deep, as our uh, production floor. So we have our fermenters down there. We have our canning line down there. I'm actually in the process of running a new glycol loop. That's why I've been huffing glue all week. Um, and so we, we do all of our production in the basement. And then we have the lagering cellars that come off and down to the side. And they have uh, very narrow entryways and very steep stairs to get in them. So we haven't we haven't come up with a good way, to, like an OSHA approved way to use them as part of the production process. Oh, damn that OSHA. Yeah, we're also all in our mid thirties. And like, I don't know the last time you wrangled a full barrel of beer, like a full oak barrel of beer, but that's not something you want getting away from you. That's a, uh, that's a career ending injury at, at 36. Um, yeah, you, you don't want to do that in your twenties, man. That's very true. We even did that. <laughs> if you have a hand cart, you don't even want to wrangle that thing. No, you really don't. I mean, it's a, it's all, it's a very heavy. Um, so yeah, yeah we, you know, we're still growing and evolving. Um, we are going to open our tap room back up June first. Uh, we 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 do a lot of Fantastic. employee uh, employee decisions. So we had an all hands meeting and we let the bartenders determine how we were going to run the bar program um, as we reopened. And so June first, and we're going to start tours again uh, the Saturday after that. Cool. And what uh, what takes place on the tours? So on the tours, um, and it's actually interesting, I think the tours may change a bit based on the discussion that we had tonight. Um, the tours uh, start usually in the tap room or the patio. We're not sure how that's gonna work with COVID, but you get a history of uh, the building and you get a history of the brewery and you learn a little bit about how beer's made, but we're very cognizant that the main draw is the is the beautiful building that we're in and the cool work we've done with the building. Like people probably don't actually care that we opened our brewery with $20,000 and we have no outside investors. People probably are maybe interested, like people are probably interested in the beers we're making, but like there's a lot of good beer in town, right? And um, so the thing that we have that's really unique is you get to actually walk through some St. Louis history and see how a modern brewery has adapted some of the these centuries old facilities or techniques into modern practice. So you get to go into the basement, production floor, you get to come down into the lagering cellars. Um, and then I think what we're gonna start doing is after the, uh, after the tour, we're gonna do a beer talk on the patio with one of the brewers or the tour guide or one of the bartenders. We haven't quite figured out how that's gonna work, but it'll be a, uh, you know, a couple of 10, 15 minutes where you get to have a beer and you get to talk about what's going on with the beer with someone who works at the brewery and you get like a really in-depth discussion. And you had to convert your patio because of COVID. 
Right, right. So we, um, our patio has always been available, but like it really was kind of, it's kind of a sideshow, you know, we had it out there, it just existed. And um, because of COVID, we really put a lot of money into both making the patio safe, but making it a place you really wanted to hang out for a long time. Um, and so we put in a fence, we put in a lot of plants, um, we got some new tables. Uh, we have kind of a split level patio. So we have this nice area that's visible from the seat. And then we have a sunken area that goes down some stairs. And then probably the most exciting part of the patio um, is we have a suspended bridge that connects um, a to-go window to the patio that you have to walk over to get your beer, which is cool. Um, and so we do have a to-go window and that's currently how you can buy beer from us. Yep. And you look on down on both sides and that's the entrance into and that's that's the entrance to the yeah to the basement and it's funny because you look down and it's you know it's like 10 feet down and you're like oh wow that's a basement entrance and then you come in the basement entrance and it's you're at the top of like a 20 foot drop you know it's it's crazy um you walk in and you're just like oh my god whoa it's really cool and it's it's been fun i've been i've been doing a lot of work high on the walls this week running the glycol loop and it's it's funny because you don't think about it you're like working and you're like man i'm standing on top of a fermenter and like my feet are like 13 feet above the ground. This is, uh, this is stupid, but you, you kind of forget, you know, and then you're like, you look down and you're like, oh yeah, I'm way up here. Um, it's pretty cool. And it is like, I'm really excited to be able to show it off and have people in for tours again. It's like, it's kind of stupid, but like, you know, we've, be, I've been here damn near every single day for the past year. And before that I was here five or six days a week and you kind of forget, right? It's just like, it's where you go to work. And I'll see someone walk in for the first time and watching them kind of take in all of this, everything we've done and how beautiful the building is. It really reminds me why we did all this. And it makes me really happy to be able to make other people happy and like connect them to history. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, when, when you get that thing back open so we can walk. So, you know, you can take me through with a beer, uh, go down in the basement and we can walk around and chit chat and have a beer and look at the history behind those caves down there. Cause that's going to be really cool. Uh, so uh, for those that are out there listening, uh, Facebook slash Zoom, uh, any questions that you have for Stuart, fire them away. Um, dude, what do you got coming up, man? I mean, I got, I, I don't, I haven't cracked it. I've got your dead druid oh, dead here. Druid and man, I, I just want, I really want to crack that thing open Saturday. So, cause I'm like, man, this thing sounds so interesting. I want to do it. So, for those in the St. Louis area that can get it, uh, can you talk a little bit about the dead druid? Yeah, the dead. It's so interesting and in how you made it. Yeah, the the dead druid king. I I really like having it on draft because I feel like it's an expression of. I feel like I've used expression a couple of times in this thing, which is to apologize. Oh well, um, I find that like we set out when we opened our brewery, we set out to make really weird beer in really high rotation. We wanted you to come in once a week and find something new, and we wanted you to find beers you had never even thought of, beers you'd never heard before, styles you were unfamiliar. with. The whole goal was really to make our bartenders lives hell by having to explain all of it <laughs> over and over and over. And, you know, I do a lot of the bartending. So like, I'm really doing this to myself, but it's all, it's a huge amount of fun. And it's cool because like we do so many unique and weird beers that we have a lot of people who don't really like beer and they'll try something that we do. And they're like, Oh man, I love this. And it's cool because you'll see them go from that to other styles. And it's, it's neat to see, people like come at beer from an odd angle and then kind of swoop in and, and start being able to speak the language a little bit. And that's really fun to me. But right. so we got, it's 8%. Again, yeah. So the dead Druid Kings 8%. It is a black wheat beer made with oak leaves instead of hops. Um, and so I was reading the Oxford Canyon to beer a long time ago, back in 2013, 24, 2013, I think. And I read about the first recorded history of brewing in Bavaria. And it was in eighth century BC and it was uh, tomb findings from a Celtic king. And it was, uh, they just, they determined that the residue on these pot shards were, uh, was a black wheat beer made with oak leaves. And so Jeff and Rebecca and I, Rebecca was our co-founder, uh, we all sat down and we discussed what we thought that beer would look like. And we were like, well, the beer is going to be a little smoky because it was going to all the, it would have been cooked over an open fire and it probably would have been alder smoke based on what they were doing. And you know, they would have been using wheat, but like it probably wasn't malted very well. So we use, uh, we use a lot of midnight wheat, which is very roasty. Um, it has a little bit of smoke to it. And then, um, but it and, doesn't have that astringency because it's dehusted. Yeah. And yeah. so, and so we were like, well, what else would be going on with this beer? And, 
And we were like, well, if they're using oak leaves and not hops, because they really, they would have had like hedge hops and those aren't, those aren't always very fun. Uh, how would you use hops to make a beer? And so I did a little experimenting and uh, we forage oak leaves and we make a tea with the oak leaves. Um, and we actually made oak leaf tea and tried it and drank it. And we were like, okay, well, this is what oak leaf tea tastes like. So I think we can shape a beer around this flavor. And so we made this black wheat beer that's about 8% by volume. And honestly, we thought it was gonna have much more body than it does. It's a very dry beer. Um, and so we made this oak leaf tea and then we brewed the beer, like the, the uh, hot liquor for the work came from the oak leaf tea. Um, oh, and, cool. And so that's what we used to make. And that was also a way to make sure it was sanitary and stuff. So you make the oak leaf tea, it's sanitized. And then you use that as your hot liquor. And then you boil it anyway. So you, you know that there's no microbes coming or going. Um, and so we. Uh, no, it's very cool that you did the, the oak leaf tea for your hot liquor tank and then moved it to the mash. Yeah. Did you add more oak to the boil? No, no, that's, that was we, it? We, we've talked about adding like oak branches or something, but I'm really worried about the amount of like tannins and astringency you can get out of like white oak. Yeah. Uh, oak leaf to make the tea to make a barrel. That's a good question. So um, we typically on our pilot system, on our pilot system, it's about a five gallon bucket of young oak leaves. And it's important to get young oak leaves. You need to go out and pick these oak leaves like in the next month, maybe the next three weeks. You need about a five gallon bucket of oak leaves. Um, yeah, and not like, not like densely packed, but you know, kind of in there. Um, but you take those oak leaves, you put them in a muslin strainer bag and you make your work. And that makes about 45 gallons of beer. So I think that if you were gonna do like a five gallon batch, you could probably get away with like, I don't know, a pound or two of oak leaves. And the nice thing about it is you really can like, you can dial in the flavor. So you can make it on the weak side and see what the oak leaves do and then kind of dial it around a little bit here and there. Um, oh, and we do, we add one single hop pellet um, to the beer because the FD, the TTB uh, does not consider gruets, beers made without hops, uh, beers under their purview and they refuse to license them. So, so you guys throw that one hop. To yeah, it has one single hop pellet added at, the, uh, <laughs> added at flame out. Uh, <laughs> what hop have we used today that we have a hop left over from? <laughs> yeah. Well, our joke originally was we were going to show the show the fermenting beer a picture of a hop cone on our phones. Uh, ah. um, or just go a single hop. Boop. Single hop. Yeah, for, single hop. You know, um, this is, this so how yeah, much that, hops goes into this? Uh, how many barrels? Uh, we use one single hop pellet for uh, seven barrels of beer. So seven barrels. So, so hold the little shot glass of the one hop next to the yep. barrel, next to seven barrels. We have our one hop. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, I mean, that's, and, you know, I actually cleared it because we had to clear the oak leaves anyway with the TTB and I wrote the whole thing out and they were like, that's fine. It's, it includes hops. Um, yeah. It doesn't say how many hops you have to have. Yeah, no, it just says it has to be made with barley and hops. Um, yep. And we did it. Uh, so... If they say you need more, you just go, okay, fine. Two pellets. How many more? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, fine. We'll go plural. Two. <laughs> one hop to trash bag of oak leaves this is very correct. And we actually do use trash bags to forage these. And we use, um, we basically use one uh, hefty contractor bag of oak leaves, which I think probably ends up weighing around 20 to 25 pounds per seven barrel run. Um, it's a hell of a mess. Yeah, and you get a lot of tick bites because it's Missouri. Um, <laughs> I got I got a stupid question. Do do oak leaves uh, vary the flavor uh, like Ooh. from South? That's not a stupid question. That's a phenomenal question, and um, that is something. Every time I take a brewer with me to forage these oak leaves, um, we try them out to see. And so in Missouri, you mostly get white oak and red oak. You might get some pin oak depending on where you are. But those are the three you're going to get. I have not noticed a huge difference in the leaf flavors. I suspect that if you were going to get a lot of difference in the uh, flavor profile, it's probably mostly going to come from the wood or the bark. Uh, but the leaves really have a very similar, there's a lot of chlorophyll to them. And like a little, only a little bit of the uh, astringency that you get out of the, uh, cause like oaks produce a lot of tannins. That's one of their defense mechanisms against insects. Um, but yeah. What about, what about roots? I, 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 I'm from St. Louis, but I, I haven't lived there in a long time. So um, uh, the, um, I'm spacing on the name of the tree, but we used to gather the roots uh, for root beer. 
Oh, yeah, oh, sarsaparilla? Yes, yes. Um, sarsaparilla, um, yeah. I'm wondering if there's roots, you know, oak roots. That's a good question. I've never, I've never thought about using oak roots, mostly because I feel like it would maybe hurt the tree if we did it. Like, if we're taking because I'm like, yeah. I'm just a really aggressive deer, right? Like, they, the trees have planned for this. So we've never pulled roots, but I wonder what that would taste like. I suspect it would be very... I don't know, man. I've, I'm going to end up digging up like an oak. I hope it's not poisonous. I'll tell you if it is. Um, <laughs> um, I'll dig one up and, and chew on it and tell you what I think. Um, you're not going to hurt the tree. You want to be careful that, you, you know, like you said, don't take a lot from a tree. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I remember we used to have to like, you know, take one or two, then go to the next tree, take one or two. Yeah. Uh, uh, next thing. And I would suspect that that, might, that, that, that flavor might change with uh, time of year. Uh, you know, what's the, what's the tree taking in and when is it right. taking it in, right? Like it's, it might be very different in January uh, uh, from August. Yeah, I, it, I think it'll be very different because you're going, you know, when you get the, when the tree's dormant during mm -hmm. the winter and then it moves into seeding and then it moves into full leaf and then going back in the door. I, I think, all right, you're, you're right. You're going to get some different flavors coming out of that root because, it, you know, plus we have, uh, you know, water content that's going on right there uh, so yeah i think you're good. same with the leaves that street was talking about you, you know for him he found the best way to do it was in the early spring when mm -hmm. they've just they, popped. they do get much more bitter and much more vegetal over time and you don't want either of those um I, so something that i'm I, thinking I, with the roots that might be interesting is you probably end up changing your water composition really hard because the roots are where all the mineral uptake happens from the tree yep. yeah and, yep. and i'll mention our you birds, some real weird stuff to your brewing water which could be fun I, I'll bet if you if you reach out to an arborist, uh, they'd be able to give you a lot of insight as to you know what, yeah. what the cycle of the tree is going on at the roots. Yeah, we're really we're really good friends with um, uh, the the whatever the arbor group in St. Louis is. They have like the Arbor Meisters Beer Fest and stuff. We we're like the only brewery in town that consistently makes weird beers with trees. Like we do a lot of sauties with cedar branches and stuff like that. And, and so we've had a lot of fun with them uh, doing like one offs and collabs and stuff. You, you have phenomenal cedar trees in a place called Cedar Hill, Missouri. We do. Is, oh, you know what? Okay, got it. Oh, yeah. No, I'm a, we, uh, I really like Eastern Red Cedar as a woodworker because it's very easy to work with. And I also like it because it grows fast and it's considered a pest tree. So you don't have to worry about, you know, like destroying the landscape, cutting down a hundred year old oak, anything like that, right? You can make your furniture. It's a very, it's a very functional tree, but it also tastes really good. Like cedar branches smell great. Um, they're really good if you use them as a, uh, uh, if you put them in your uh, mash tun and lauder your grain through them, you get this really almost creamy woodiness off of them. It's phenomenal. A um, lot of fun. Very cool. So, you know, I don't really know what else to ask you. I mean, questions are open right now, but uh, Stuart, uh, you know, last pints to you. What are you working on? What are you brewing with? Uh, and I got to tell you, I, you know, if you need somebody to go foraging with for oak leaves, you know, email me. I will. Well, I, I was, I, I think I told Ryan uh, when he was up grabbing the beers, but traditionally I would roll down to harvest the oak leaves and I'd take an audio book and I'd smoke a bowl in my truck. Yeah, I'm not doing that. Around and it would take me like eight hours to get all these oak leaves, and I'd listen to a whole bunch of audiobook. Um, and then uh, I took my brewer Danielle with me last year, and we did not smoke weed ahead of time, and we got done in like two hours. Yeah. So it was. You, if you want to do it, you're fine. I'm I'm out on it though. But I'll, I'll forge. Right. But you know, you can smoke your bowl if you want. But I won't be joining you on that. Uh, I'll join with the beer and foraging. Uh, but yeah, give me a fire me an email, maybe. I'll, we'll do. Uh, I think I, I don't. I don't think we're doing it this year. Um, I think we have a barrel aged, uh, we have a, we have uh, some dead Druid King that's been sitting for a year in the barrels and we actually have a, because Ooh. the economy is opening back up, we have a bit of a production crunch. So we're gonna, we're gonna release barrel aged dead Druid King this year and then roll from that to uh, next year, we'll do a, a, another version of dead Druid King and we'll divert a bunch of it to barrels. Again. What's, what's it aged in, what barrel? It is aged in, I might be wrong, but I believe it's in a port barrel. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was a weird one. I don't remember why we came up with that, but it seemed, it made a lot of sense at the time. I want to say. I think it makes sense though for that beer. Yeah, I think it might be in like a, oh man, I have, I'd have to go look at our barrel. I'm pretty sure it's in a tawny port or a ruby port barrel. I haven't tasted it, but just from the flavor and everything I've read and that you've told me about, the port barrel makes a lot of sense. I think it would be really fun. I think we were looking to like kind of highlight the venuous character um, 
So we have a, we did a barrel aged version of it um, a few years back. We did it in a still 630 barrel and we uh, we put the all of the Brett's blend in it and it was incredible. I loved it so much. Um, it's a, uh, I've been pushing to develop a Brett program and uh, my seller guy, who's my business partner, Jeff, is just like, we got to get a lot more efficient with everything else we do if you're going to like double our workload by running a side by side Brett program. So we're working on that. Like that's my, if I get all my homework done and, and, and get our uh, efficiency numbers way up in terms of man hours per barrel of beer, then yeah. Plus you have plus you plus you also have the concern of cross contamination. That's that's part of the doubling is because you do have to you have to maintain a separate set of equipment. And like we're really we're very serious about our equipment maintenance and our cleaning and everything else. So like that's like a huge I mean it's a huge amount of what every brewery does, but Jeff is really like he lies awake at night thinking of new ways to CIP equipment. It's really cool. Yeah. Um, if you're so, gonna Speaking of, if you're going to open a brewery with anyone out there thinking of opening a brewery, find someone that loves cellaring. Um, because if you have someone who is willing to put in ridiculous hours on cellaring your beer to perfection, um, your beer is going to be a lot better for it. Yeah. Or find somebody who loves to clean. Yeah. We'll turn <laughs> people that love cellaring also love cleaning. And cool. um, uh, two broken, two, you know, yeah. Kill two birds with one stone on that. Right. Uh, so, uh, Stuart, uh, love to keep talking to you are you know everybody's welcome to stay on but i'm going to end uh a pint with tonight right now uh because we cover everything but everybody's welcome to stay on for some back porch time thank you everybody for joining us and we'll see you next uh next time on may 3rd with chris from stubborn german where we're going to explore alt beer and some classic german beers take care everybody see you on may 3rd thank you very much have a good night uh email me stuart s-t-u-a-r-t at earthboundbeer.com if you have questions Sounds good, Stuart. Thank you. Do, 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 do.